Well, Dan, thank you for organizing this, and uh, I want to thank the sponsors and all of you for staying. Uh, I'm all that stands between you and the mythical uh, craft beer that you've been hearing about all afternoon from Dan. So, <laughs> I don't have any disclosures except that I shouldn't have gone with Gurdish to Tijuana last night and lost my voice. No, just kidding. <laughs> so what, I'm going to try to bring it all home and uh, really encapsulate for you what the challenges are of doing ERAS. And that I just want to ask the room, how many of you are actively involved in the ERAS cardiac program or thoracic program in your institution? And then how many are planning in the next six to 12 months? So I think th those are the ones who are really hopefully uh, will get something out of this. Like everything else in our field, this too has been studied. So there have been qualitative studies trying to understand what the barriers are and enablers to these type of programs. And a couple of common themes uh, always come out that you gotta have some standardized guidelines, order sets, the need for education, the use of champions. I mean, this is all kind of basic stuff. But what I found is this slide is important, is that you're gonna encounter enablers and barriers in all three of those areas. So you're gonna have nurses that are gonna enable you. They're gonna be very empowered by the fact that they get to spend time with families, patients, and educate them. The nurses are very passionate about that, and that's the other thing I might say is, don't even think about attempting this program without having a nurse champion and a nurse navigator, which we'll talk about more. On the other hand, there's some nurses that are gonna be naysayers and be the barrier because they look at it as more work. Similarly, you're gonna have surgeons that are gonna be champions uh, at our institution, like I had in a couple in my group, and then you're gonna have a couple in your group that are gonna be naysayers. Say, so why do we need to do this? We're already doing this. Uh, this is not gonna make any difference, so you're gonna have to win them over. And anesthesiologists, uh, even though this has kind of been innate to them, they're seeing this across the spectrum. For example, my own anesthesiologist, they're doing it in colorectal and orthopedics and GYN, when I said it, let's do this in cardiac, they're like, nah, we don't really need to do that. We have echo, we already balanced the fluids out don't really need it. So you're gonna find barriers and enablers and you gotta identify those folks and then partner with them. The next thing is you have to decide, do you wanna do ERAS as a pilot or do you wanna go all in in a full implementation? So in my institution, we did a pilot. So then if you're gonna do a pilot, are you gonna do it with just cabbage? Are you gonna do it with just valves? Are you gonna do all comers? And then the way we did it in HCA is we chose three facilities and we were kind of purposeful in this because we wanted to see who does ERAS make a difference in high performing facilities. In other words, three star facilities. We wanted to see does it make a difference in two star facilities and does it make uh, a difference in one star facilities. So you may want to look at it and stratify it. If any of you are uh, involved with uh, systems of care, um, then the IDNs, you might want to see how that would play out. The next thing is decide what's gonna be out of the scope of ERAS. Certainly, there are gonna be some patients and some populations that just don't fit the profile. Next thing is create a timeline. Without timelines and without people having specific responsibility and accountability and deliverables, it'll never happen. So you've gotta say this is how we're gonna do it and someone's gonna to have to decide the kickoff needs to really be a kind of a big deal because everybody in the facility needs to hear about it and know about it. Uh, without that, it's not gonna happen. Then you wanna determine, and this is the pre-work, what workflow changes are gonna have to take place to create ESR, because there will be some. There's gonna be, it's like the who moved my cheese thing. Something is gonna uh, upset the apple cart somewhere and you gotta figure that out. We couldn't anticipate all of them. Hopefully you can anticipate more of them than we did. The other thing, is there anyone in this room that's not on an electronic order set entry? I can't imagine at this era, but. So that's one of the first steps I would argue that you do is go in and figure out the electronic order entry. We created an ESR order set, because again, we did it as a pilot approach. So make sure your order set, because that can alleviate a lot of the pain points right there. Equipment, we can talk a little bit more about that. You gotta get those training, go live, and then measuring the metrics as you go along. And then finally, closing it out and looking to see, did it make a difference? Where did it make a difference? Where can it make more of a difference? So the other, the other thing is set your goals. What are your goals? Do you want to look, look at reducing post-op complications and then define those? Go ahead and decide which complications you want to look at. Do like Dan did. Do you want to look at readmissions? Do you want to look at AFib? And if you're going to look at AFib, you know, which uh, intervention do you want to do? Do you want to make the chest tube the intervention? Is it acute kidney injury? What, what change do you want to adopt to affect those endpoints? And then also look at secondary outcomes because those are the ones that are actually going to really get your administrator's interest. The first ones, are a lot of them are, are clinical ones, and we get excited about those. But administration, they get excited about lengths of stay, cost, and so forth. So what about the pathway? So we're all familiar with the pathway, but each component of this pathway is gonna present a unique challenge. And we'll talk a little bit about that and uh, see if it makes sense. So 
let's just think about the outpatient setting. So if you're gonna give these folks a video or a brochure or do the nutritional assessment, how's that gonna be done? Where's that gonna be done? And does, is your clinic equipped to do this today? Are you gonna, is that gonna disrupt your patient flow? Do you need to set up a separate room that they go into after you see them that they can sit in and now watch this video? All of this has to be thought out because it's, not, it's gonna, again, change the way you do things, but have a positive uh, effect. The drink is really important, right? We've all talked about the carb loading. So where's that gonna happen? Are you gonna stock that in your office? Is that gonna be stocked at pre-op? And then who's gonna make sure the patient goes home with it? Who's gonna remind the patient to drink it? When are they gonna drink it? And then on the day of surgery, taking all those medications and the checklist. Remember, when you're dealing with elderly patients, sometimes you have to empower a family member to help these patients do all this. They're not gonna be able to do all this on their own. We can talk about all the gizmos and gadgets and web-based things and apps, but you know, grandmother at 74, that may be a little bit beyond her if she's not the, the heavy Facebook user. Then on the preoperative side, on inpatient, same thing, we ran into this challenge. So let's say now you wanna give the, the drink on, on the inpatient floor. Who's gonna do that? Is that the night shift for the first case? And your second case is moving along, so who's communicating down to the OR that Reddy's finished with his first case, he's already calling for the second case, oh, we didn't give the drink yet. So that has to be done, and nutritional assessment, will that look different in the hospital than it does in your office? Same thing on the day of surgery, one of the biggest complaints we got was from our anesthesiologists, because we get do TE on all our patients, they said, well, you guys are just sucking these drinks out. You know, you put the, we put the NG tube down to put the TE probe in and the drink's all coming back. Very different from colorectal, because in colorectal, they don't, they don't sump out their stomach. So it has much more time to absorb. So you have to think out, maybe the two hour time point is not the right time point. Maybe it's four hours before or six hours before. So that's what we did, uh, move it back. Then in terms of uh, intra-op management, one of the key points that I learned here was, in our program at least, how many of you have anesthesiologists in the room during your entire case? And I had that in Texas, and I loved it. She was amazing. I've never, I mean, our anesthesiologists are there for induction, they're for the TE, and they're when we come off pump, and that's it. So the CRNAs are another group of folks who you've got to incorporate into this process. And let me tell you, some CRNAs are very heavy-handed with fentanyl and opioids. I mean, one of the ways we actually cut our extubation time was just tracking it by CRNA, and we found out we had, uh, you know, you recently heard about Candyman in the White House. These people were really <laughs> into the candy. So um, that was uh, kind of something we had to figure out, but it takes a lot of iterative thinking. And goal-directed therapy, again, what goal are you gonna go by? Are you gonna go by the ESR machine, uh, like the EV1000, or are you gonna go by TE and ECHO? So we had a little difficulty with our anesthesiologists actually going and hooking up the machine at the end of the case and start following goal-directed therapy at that time point. On the post-op side, some of the challenges are gonna be, again, with your ICU nurses. There are a lot of them are used to the protocol. Maybe a lot of these protocols work fine. You'll have to decide in your program how you wanna do these. So, uh, some nurses are, were not used to giving meds uh, prophylactively or preemptively. They wanted to wait till the patient reported nausea. And we had to kind of educate them, say, no, the part of this protocol is going in preventing the very nausea. Same thing with multimodal pain. A lot of uh, our nurses were uneasy with really backing down on pain and wanted to ask us, how do you manage that? You got some great tips today from a lot of our fellow panelists on resetting the expectations for pain, asking is the, what level of pain they have, and really rethinking how you want to address pain. As someone said next to me here in the audience, they said, you know, we were taught during my era, pain was the fifth vital. I mean, you know, if you didn't address their pain and really load them up with morphine and have a quiet, happy patient, then you were failing. We've come a, a long way on that thinking, but I think the pendulum may have swung too far. We don't necessarily have to do opioid-free surgery, but certainly we should be very cautious and judicious with our opioids. Then um, dream goals, don't make your dream a nightmare, right? I think it's very uh, reasonable to talk about oral nutrition, but don't be, get too much into dogma. We're, we're very methodical about the way we do liquids. I encourage uh, patients to really focus on the liquid side. Don't feel like they have to eat a, a whole meal before they, you know, before two days have gone out. This was something we discovered that really was very powerful. There are a couple of papers out there. Did anyone in, your, uh, in this group do the hard candy or chewing gum? One of the most impressive ways to, to shorten ileus times. Get them to go, go, go and start chewing gum or a hard lemon candy or uh, something I've been sucking on today to get this horse uh, voice down. Early mobilization. So um, I think this is very PT and OT dependent. We had to really go back and educate our PTs. You heard from uh, Gerdish today. I mean, everybody can move very quickly now if you played them, right? So uh, the sternal precautions, rethinking what you want your sternal precautions to be, retraining your PTs and OTs to work with these patients in a more uh, aggressive, goal-directed manner. Make sure they see the checklist too. 
see, they're operating off their own checklist. If you don't give them the ERAS checklist, there's a big disconnect there. So they've got to both, everyone's got to be on the same page. Identifying the patient, you know, figure out in your system, if you're going to go all in, it's pretty easy, right? Everybody's ESR. That's kind of the way I've done it with my patient population. But if you're going to do it as a pilot, figure out who you want them to be ESR, make sure they have a bright pink band or something that identifies that patient, labels that patient so everybody knows throughout the pathway of care during that hospitalization, they're ESR and should be treated that way. Um, another way you can do it through your surgery tracker, you can make sure that the uh, OR folks know about it, that when it's on the board they have a special dot or sticker, but the key is to avoid confusion. That happened early on when we implemented our pilot, like I had people always coming up to me, now Dr. Reddy, is this patient on ESR? I'm like, so I just made it easy, I said all my patients are on ESR. But if you have partners who are not on that pathway, then make sure you have a way of identifying these patients. And, I, and I'm very curious to hear uh, ideas from any of you all in the room on this too. In terms of patient education, you got to really think about how you want to accomplish this. You know, the web, this videos that you want them to watch, are they going to watch in the office? Do you want to watch them at home? Are you going to make sure that it's web-based? Are you going to use some metric like Dan's talked about to make sure the patient has watched them? Um, there are a lot of tools now coming out on ensuring that patients are actually adherent to the ESR pathway and really setting these expectations. Some people don't like videos, they like brochures, so figure out if you want to do it by brochure. We created some, handed to them, I don't know how many ended up in the garbage, ended up, you know, in the back of the car, or if they read them, but I think it's key to make sure you understand not everybody's gonna be on Twitter with the, uh, by the way, you can take pictures of any of my slides, no dead birds uh, on, on mine. Uh, I think we're okay. <laughs> But uh, the, uh, the whole key is figure out the, the modality that your patients are going to respond to, and it may be many different modalities. Um, here's the checklist. So make sure they have a checklist and make sure you have extras available, because I guarantee you the patient will show up the morning without the checklist. So you send them <laughs> home with it, then they come in, it's kind of like I forgot my homework, so make sure you have plenty of copies of those uh, in the uh, early morning admission area. The carbohydrate drink, we already talked about it. Where is it stored? Where are you going to give it to them? Who's going to have it? How are you going to treat your second and third cases of the day if they're inpatients? And really consider, are you giving it to diabetic patients with gastroparesis? Give them extra time for the drink to, tr to have transit. You can't cookbook this too much. Everybody wants to say, give the drink at two hours. Well, we found out that didn't work because of our anesthesia and the TE thing. You move it back to four hours. May work, but doesn't really work if the patient has gastroparesis. So you got to start asking those questions and figuring that out. And then, you know, inevitably some of them do get sucked out by anesthesia, but uh, that's, a, that's a learning curve. Goal-directed therapy, I don't need to belabor this too much. Uh, a couple of learning uh, points, you know, they're great machines, you get a lot of data out of them, but uh, what we learned uh, through all this is it doesn't work with a balloon pump. You gotta have a really good arterial line. So if you got an arterial line that's crummy or has a poor waveform, those machines are giving you bad information. So garbage in, garbage out. They do take nurse training and education. You know, sometimes in ICU, we have turnover in the nurses, so the new ones d didn't really know how to use it. So just because you do the launch of the pilot and you've done the education somewhere a month or two into it, make sure all the new nurses in the unit know how to use this machine. You gotta cover the day shift and the night shift. The machines are not infallible. You gotta make sure the cables work, the machines work, they're updated, they're kept uh, in good order. And you just gotta recognize that still, good clinical acumen doesn't trump the, the, um, the machine, the EV1000. If it's giving you some weird numbers, just step back and go back to your critical care basic skills. Because uh, we know that that's happened. Sometimes the, the, uh, our uh, ICU nurses, well-meaning, get, get too far down on that quote-unquote goal-directed therapy and they're way off the pathway. And so it still needs some good uh, interaction with intensivists. Um, I think to finish out, so my conclusions were, you decide on your pilot or decide on going all in. Make sure you do the pre-work because it's going to be substantial. You got to involve all the stakeholders. You got to get buy-in. I think the nurse navigator may be the single most important and critical part of this, maybe more essential than the physician champion because that individual is going to be the internal champion. He or she is going to be the one that makes sure patients are on the pathway, that the education component's happening. They're going to be putting out the fires that inevitably happen when you get the phone call saying, what are we supposed to do with this? Because it doesn't, when it doesn't go as planned. Expect the unexpected, lost drinks, broken machines, deviations from the medications, you know, somebody in the ICU getting Tordal or getting uh, meds that they shouldn't, it just happens. But that's okay, use that as a learning experience and just get back on the pathway. And uh, stick with it, look for continuous fine tuning and celebrate success. So throughout your pilot, you know, take pauses, get everyone together, say this is what's going great, give them back some data and celebrate that success. So at the end of the day, you can look at that phrase right there and decide, is opportunity now here or is it nowhere? And I think your, your program has to decide how you wanna approach that.
So questions, comments, discussions.